going to give a short talk about internal mounts. Mounts that you don't see when you're in a museum, but that are still keeping the objects safe and secure. Over 10 years ago, the Harvard Art Museums embarked on a renovation and expansion project designed by Renzo Piano. We reopened in 2014 with a space that embraced a more open and accessible display of artwork. Many objects that had been covered by vitrines in the past came out from under them, which precipitated the need for a casework redesign, one that would allow access inside the pedestal for the safe mounting of these objects. Here's an example of an accessible pedestal. One side serves as a door, much like a kitchen cabinet, and it can be secured shut once the installation is complete. This new access has allowed for a redesign of mounts in several instances. With internal access to a pedestal, a new mount can be designed that can be fitted and secured to the inside of the artwork and then bolted through the deck of the pedestal. <clears throat> in the past, these sculptures would have had basic tab mounts that noticeably secured the objects in place. Of course, we still do this in instances where there's no way to mount an object from within it, or in this particular case, the sculpture is on a cylindrical pedestal with no access inside. Sculptures with inner cavities, modern bronzes in particular, are good candidates for internal mounts. In fact, all the examples I'm going to show you will be modern bronzes. The space inside the object as well as its size and structure, dictate how an internal mount will engage with the object. <clears throat> These mounts generally use multiple parts that either screw together, expand using nuts and bolts like a turnbuckle, or in some other way engage with each other to fit into an object. Undercuts on the inside of objects are highly desirable, allowing for an easy grip to be had once a mount is tightened into place from within. Warning, these mounts are not pretty. The words plain, clumsy, and ugly can be used to describe them. I'm going to show you seven examples. But first, I will share some social media from the museum to prove that I can make an adequate regular mount. Okay, let's look at these mounts. <clears throat> this is a small bronze by an unknown artist titled Aeolus and the Winds. You will see that the base of the sculpture tapers in, creating a nice undercut. A mount that expands within this space will work well. There's no need to worry about the rest of the interior space. Here's the mount in two parts. It has been sealed with B72, an acrylic resin dissolved in acetone, and padded with felt where it will touch the base of the sculpture. <clears throat> the larger part of the mount has two threaded rods brazed on for bolting into the top of the pedestal. In this photo, the mount is upside down. The part at right also has threaded rods brazed on, but the rods are not attached to the tubes on the other side. They are separate parts. By tightening the nuts toward the brass tubes, the mount expands to fit snugly in the base. Here it is in the sculpture, before and after tightening. For installation, I always make a template beforehand. <clears throat> Take a piece of mat board, use a hole punch to make holes spaced the same as the bolts, Fit the object on the mat board with the mount attached and then trace the object. On installation day, mark where the object has been placed on the deck, replace it with the template and make your marks for drilling. So here's the object ready for installation. And here it is in the gallery, dwarfed by two large Dutch portraits, but nonetheless excitingly uncovered. Next is Kneeling Youth with a Shell by George Minnick. This was a fun object to make a mount for. The negative space from the legs inside the base form the perfect area for an expanding mount. A similar mechanism is used for this mount as the last, except now only part of the mount expands. The threaded rod is brazed to the top brass strap and is again loose in the tube below. As the nut is tightened toward the tube, the brass straps flex outward, moving the silicone cushioned arms to tighten into the legs of the sculpture. Once the mount is secured, this object is ready to be bolted to the pedestal. And here is the Min with his friends in the Bush Risinger Winter Garden. Next, we'll talk about the Barlock in the same gallery. This is the Avenger by Ernst Barlock. Now this mount might win the prize for most stupid looking, but it is also really simple and effective. Here is a view of the base of the sculpture. This space will allow for a very simple two-part mount thanks in part to the little connection between the two openings. 
First, a polyethylene base plate for the foot of the sculpture is screwed to the pedestal top. A hole has been drilled in it and the pedestal to receive the second part of the mount. The second part of the mount is a threaded brass hook padded with heat shrink tubing, which secures the sculpture down to the pedestal, bolting it through the pre-drilled hole. The sculpture looks great with uninterrupted lines as it was meant to be seen. Next is Grand Arabesque, third time by Degas. This sculpture needs a mount to support a long angled leg and has limited space at the base with a very shallow footprint. Consisting of three parts, this mount inserts into the leg of the sculpture with the two arms at the middle, stopping at the base, and a third part which slips up and locks all the pieces into place. You'll see here that this arm is brazed to the long stem of the mount, and this arm is brazed to a nut, which can turn on the threaded rod. This series of images illustrates how to fit the mount into the sculpture. First, the mount slips into the leg at the correct angle. Then the arms are fished into place in the recess from the foot and then opened to fill the space. Finally, the third piece slips down onto the rod and bolts into place between the arms to stabilize the mount. This mount is now locked into place with no rotation possible, allowing for an intimate and dynamic display in our wartime gallery. This next sculpture is Perseus Slaying Medusa by Giovanna, Giovanni Battista Foggini. But first, a tangent. You'll notice that there is still investment inside this object, left over from the casting process. Investment is a mold making material used in bronze casting. Sometimes this mixture of plaster and silic sand hasn't been fully cleaned out of the inside of a sculpture. These areas should be avoided as much as possible for both a good mount fit and so as not to disturb the condition of the object. When designing this mount, a big consideration was the convoluted interior of this sculpture. It has a few smaller recesses that can be gripped, but only from different angles. A two-part mount that screws together once each part is put in place will allow for a secure mounting within this interior. The first part is placed into this curved groove, avoiding the investment left nearby. The second part fits into two adjacent cavities above and is aligned with the first part of the mount. Once the two parts are screwed together, this mount fits tightly and is ready for installation. And here's Perseus and Medusa as part of a display of Rococo and neoclassicism in the 18th century. Next is Ile de France by Aristide Maillot, a larger example of a modern bronze. Two views of this expanding mount show that one end engages with the space inside the toes on the right front foot, and the other end engages the left back foot. This slide shows this relationship more clearly. The mount is tightened into place with the object laying down. Once bolted to the platform, the object can be raised up and into place by hand. The platform is then secured to the gallery floor via wooden cleats underneath. And here's the sculpture on view in the wartime gallery, very near the Degas sculpture that we discussed earlier. My last example is Countess Matilda of Tuscany by Gian Lorenzo Bernini. The interior space of this sculpture is narrow and irregular, resulting in a more complicated three-part mount. You'll see that these two parts connect by just one point, allowing them to pivot or rotate at that point. The two main mount parts are fished into the cavity while loosely engaged and adjusted until there is a good fit in the recesses. Then the nut is firmly tightened. Now that the arms of the mount are stable, the mounting bracket can be attached providing the bolts for securing the object to the pedestal. Here is Matilda installed on the West Arcade of the museum, washed in natural light. I will quickly touch on alternative materials and techniques. While I'm using brass and steel rod in all of these mounts, in some instances, different materials can be utilized additionally. For a larger object, polyethylene, polyurethane board, or sealed poplar can work in tandem with brass to provide more structure to a mount also, we often use a two-part epoxy with brass parts, which would work great with some smaller, more complicated interior spaces. As we know in this line of work, often a mount can be made in more than one way. I look forward to seeing how other mount makers work with object interiors and what expanding mechanisms are used in other institutions.
I'll end with saying that while it is always satisfying to make an elegant mount that safely secures an object without calling attention to itself, it is fun and refreshing to make one that seems clumsy, even ugly, but secures an object effectively and invisibly. Thanks so much for listening, and I look forward to discussing further in the Q&A. Hi, Jill. Thank you so much. Um, I completely disagree. I think your mounts were an amazingly elegant solution, and you were getting some love in the chat. Um, I think Laura will come on and lead us in Q&A. Hello again. Yes, we're getting lots of good um, questions in the Q&A and I totally agree with everyone. Your mount is beautiful. Um, how do you map the interior spaces to create the shapes which expand into them? Oh, um, uh, that's a good question. I mean, each object is different. So um, I basically just get in there and start, you know, feeling around, you know, like, um, I don't know how to answer that one. Um, <laughs> I mean, you've seen from the photos, like they're very, they're pretty gnarly inside. And, uh, you know, when I was doing this presentation, I thought at the end, like, oh, I didn't show any epoxy work. And that's why I added it. Um, but you know, sometimes these spaces are so narrow and you, you kind of don't want to put epoxy in there. You know, you kind of, so trial and error, I guess is my answer. And do you, this is my question. Do you, are you using epoxy sculpt for your two-part epoxy? Um, we have like a PC Marine epoxy. Yes, in the little, in it's, the little tube. It's like Mighty Putty that you slice. Yes, that stuff is great. I've also used something called epoxy in the past, which is a two part and it's softer. So it's easier sometimes when you need like a softer. Uh, oh, right. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, boop, 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 boop. How long did you spend on that mount for the Degas sculpture? Um, you know, actually that's one of the ones that I didn't make. Uh, an old colleague uh, of mine uh, made it. Uh, I'm not sure, but something tells me he didn't, it didn't take him too long. He was pretty fast. Um, uh, what techniques, tips, if any, do you have for referencing and measuring sizes and angles, um, keeping the bronze with the investment being in mind? Mm. Um, well, that object in particular had, like I said, had a, a, a few different like concavities that were pretty particular. And so that first part that I put in, it kind of just had this curved groove in it. And so that's where I started from. Um, you know, this is kind of like the first question. I mean, it's kind of like, you know, someone earlier was talking about like carving ethophone and it is just sort of like, you know, you carve a little here, carve a little there, fit it in and, um, you know eventually you get it or you start over. Right, it goes into the special filing cabinet called the trash can and you start over again. Yes. Exactly, exactly. Um, question, why not thread brass elements rather than brazing to steel? Uh, um, I mean, you could do that. Uh, I, um, we, I, you know, I think one of the first ones what mount like this that I did, I actually used like some stainless steel uh, screws that I had, machine screws. Um, and since you can braise it, uh, you know, why not? But also I used a lot of threaded rod. I mean, it's stronger. Um, and then I didn't feel like cutting the thread and brass. So that's why I used it. Have you ever used heated acrylic to make form fitted elements which harden when cool? I have not. That's a cool <laughs> answer. Um, do you install the interior mount in your studio or do you usually do that in the installation space? Um, I would say probably most times you would install it in the sculpture when you're installing it. I mean, there are instances where an object will have an internal mount and then it's, it's easier to have it in storage like that. Um, uh, one thing we, that we used to do before we had internal access to pedestals is we'd make these like wooden display blocks and have things bolted through those and then those would get screwed 
so to the top of pedestals. So there have been times where we leave a sculpture on a block like that and then have that in storage like that. Hmm. Um, this is a question that I'm not sure you should answer. Uh, I'll let you decide, uh -oh. which is how are the doors in the pedestals locked? Um, I mean, I feel like I gave some tips in the photo, but um, I don't know. There's like a, I don't know. I'm not going to answer it. Yes, that's fair. That's fair. There are some <laughs> secrets that should always be secrets. Um, and oh, there's a comment. It seems like an understanding of casting and negative space in the underside of the base is super important. Wait, that's a that's a comment, not a question. It's a comment. Right. Can, I agree. I can, you can agree. That's great. Um, let's see. Oh, do all of your pedestals have doors? Were those made in house? Uh, they were not made in house. Um, do all of our pedestals have doors? Uh, a great deal of them. Um, a, a lot, but like I think most of the newer ones from when we renovated, we still sometimes use some older ones that we keep in storage. Mm -hmm. um, but that's sort of like the way we've gone. Um, it's we used Gopion, so Italian. Um, and I had a question about your museum, which is how many visitors do you typically get a year? Oh, oh. no. Oh. Um, we probably get a, a lot. We probably get a lot of tourists. Um, I don't have that number. I don't know. Okay. I was just curious. Um, oh, here's a good question. Have you ever lost mount components inside the sculptures? No, I don't think I have. That's great. I mean, I've definitely dropped things in the shop floor and had to scramble to look for them, but uh, do you store anything in those pedestals, like the design specs for your mounts? Um, no, not design specs. Uh, I'm trying to think of some, well, we'll put like barcoded tags in there um, for the objects. Uh, sometimes we'll keep like a, ha like a housing for something, rarely, mm -hmm. but we might, but mostly it's just empty. So you use barcoding to track your objects? Yes. Okay. Um, as casts often have variation in, mat in material thickness in different areas, how do you assess which points were robust enough to take the pressure of the mounts? <clears throat> I mean, all the, all the bronzes I've made mounts for have been pretty hardy. Like, I can't think of anything the only thing I can think of is like, I don't know if you noticed, but um, with uh, the, um, the George of the Minna sculpture, there um, were like little plaster, like there had been some conservation done, um, at, but I didn't need to have any kind of interaction with that part of the sculpture, so it didn't matter. I, I would say that these bron modern bronzes are very hardy and I haven't had to worry about it. Um, this sort of relates to that, which is, do you weight the pedestals or do you use a floor attachment? Uh, the, all the pedestals are screwed down to the floor. Screwed down. Um, if one of these sculptures go on loan, do you travel with the sculpture in order to install it? Uh, it, it depends on the loan. Um, <clears throat> we did in the last year have a, um, a sculpture that did have an internal mount and a, that went on loan like recently I think I, I'm losing my train of thought just in the last like year or two and a colleague of mine went with it but we actually decided to keep that mount it traveled with the mount attached to the inside so that it would stay in sync with everything um so yeah I, I didn't go on that trip but that mount stayed inside the object mm -hmm. um I had I don't it, in my museum, I don't typically deal with a lot of brass sculptures, so I had never heard of investment. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, do you ever run across um, sculptures that it's like real crumbly inside? Like that would be terrifying. 
that's how it is because you do like you do like you set it on a table you're working you move it and there's like little uh, bits of sand yeah so uh, what do you do i mean it's historic investment i mean like i said like i you know i made that mound a while back so i i don't re recall a conversation with um conservation but i mean i think that you're just going to lose a little bit of it with movement of the object but yeah I would avoid an area that has a has a lot of it. Yeah, and is so. What is the? I don't know anything about sculpture. Is it? Is the casting material? Is it plaster that's inside? You know, I did. This is what I did. Some foundry work in college, and um, I think there are a couple different ways of uh, bronze casting, making the molds. Um, but what we used was investment, and you would just sort of you would have a wax, and then you put plaster and sand make a mixture and cast that all around it. Mm -hmm. Put it in a kiln, the wax burns out, bring it back out, pour your metal in, molten metal. Um, and, and, and rarely does it, I mean, I, I spent too much time on it maybe, but people had questions. So I added it in for a fun fact, but usually these sculptures are very clean. That's great news. <laughs> um, question of what department are you based in? I'm in the I'm in the exhibitions department, exhibitions and production. Um, I notice some people are in conservation, and I find that fascinating. I'd love to know, you know, like what the numbers are. Yeah. I'm also in a union. Yes. Oh, you're also in a union. I am. Um, how much time in advance do you need to plan um, to make mounts like these? Um, you know, I mean, maybe it's not any different than other mounts. Uh, except that there might be more trial and error. Like, you know, we try to do things, you know, months in advance. Um, and, and these were a group of mounts that we did, you know, when we were, they were redoing a museum. So we had hundreds of mounts to make and they were just on a list. Um, so. It's a lot of mounts. Yeah. Um, does the floor have inserts to screw the pedestals in or the pedestals have permanent positioning on the floors? Um, most of the pedestals have like a kind of a metal armature and with holes and you can put screws in, into the floor. Um, if it's like a taller, like if we have like a big heavy bust or something and it's on a very tall skinny pedestal, we'll actually like bolt that pedestal into the subfloor. Um, and then like a situation like the Myol that had, was that I mounted on the platform first, then I would just like put wooden cleats, screw those onto the floor, and then you put the platform on top and screw from the sides kind of thing. Right. Um, I think we have about one minute left. Um, what, what union, what, which union applies to being a mount maker? Um, well, I work at a university and um, it's the Harvard Union of Clerical and Technical Workers. Um, uh, you know, I mean, we like we're we have different grades, like our job titles. And like if you get to a certain height of grade, you're kind of out of the union. Um, so I don't know how it works at other places, but. All right. Um, well, we still have a little bit of time left. What kind of metal did you use in the mount? Um, and mostly, I mean, mostly all those um, mounts were made of brass and stainless steel. Um, there was maybe, there were some parts that were like polyethylene or a little bit of wood here or there, but mostly brass. Okay, I think that, that's it for questions. I just saw that there was a question that asked if I was tenured. I am not tenured. <laughs> I wish. All right, if you have more questions for Jill, you're gonna have to find her at the, at the after party today or, uh, or contact her directly. Um, Jill, I just wanna say, like I appreciated that you showed us a whole series of these types of mounts so that we could really get a sense of how you create like this mountain vocabulary for the inside spaces to help me think it through.